Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and today we're going to dive into how to use Delta Table Identity Column. What are we going to cover specifically here, Brian? We'll start with what is an identity column, the use cases for when you would use them, of course, and how to create an identity column. Then we need to talk about the challenges to just having identity columns on a scaled out platform. And we'll talk about the limitations. So what is an identity column? It is an automatically incrementing value like one, two, three. And you assign the identity type to a table column. Now the goal of using identity columns is to get a unique column value for every row. And they're very popular in relational databases, especially SQL Server. Now, some databases like Oracle used to use something called a sequence, which is very similar, but identity columns are ubiquitous in SQL Server because they didn't have a sequence object. So you could only use identity columns when you wanted to get this kind of a feature. So as I mentioned, it's like a sequence, but a sequence is a separate object that will increment. And every time you grab a value, it just increments it, but it's not directly connected to the column itself. So what are use cases of this, Brian? It provides a guaranteed unique primary key. That's really the best use case. And because they use integers, they generally perform well, especially in things like joins. And you don't have to provide a value on an identity column insert. In other words, you insert and you ignore the identity column as if it doesn't exist, and it will automatically get an incremental value. It's a very popular way to create surrogate keys in a traditional SQL database data warehouse. So let's talk about how identity columns work. An example here of the code that you would use in Databricks to create a table with an identity column is here. So it's a very simple table. I got this example from the blog link below, but I'm going to make a slight enhancement to it in a minute. But you can see here that you create a column just like any other ID, and you say it's a big int, and it's generated always as identity. A thing to remember here is it must be a big int data type. It can't be an int. I tried that. It don't work. And it tells you in the documentation it must be a big int. And the generated always means that it will always generate, as it says, the value for it. So you don't have to worry about it once you create it. And so here's some examples of doing inserts into the table. And I want to point out that you are not giving it a value, right, for the identity column. You're inserting, in this case, the product type and sales, but you ignore the first column, which is the identity column. And if you did that, you can see on the right, what you get is the product you inserted, the sales, and an automatically increasing integer. So Brian, what are the challenges to having an identity column on a scaled out platform like Snowflake or Databricks or any other thing, like even Synapse? Well, good question. The problem you get is, imagine the table we saw earlier. Imagine it's got like a trillion rows. And in a scaled out platform, you typically have multiple machines running in parallel. So you have node one, node two. These would be your worker nodes if this was a really large table. So the first challenge is, how does the service get the next incremental value for an identity column? Well, if it tried to do like a max, it would have a problem because it would have to do like max ID, what's the highest value so far. You have to search across all of the nodes. So in this example, the dot, dot, dot means it goes all the way up to 300 nodes. And since you don't know how this is distributed, it's like a search across 300 independent databases because that's how it's sort of set up. Nodes are really independent of each other and it would have to do that search across all of them. So obviously that would not work. So maybe there's a way it could you know, kind of keep a little object like a sequence on the side to, to kind of keep track of this. But that could also cause some challenges here. Imagine on the left, you have new data coming in, and we're going to call this a massive batch insert. So we've got like a, a million rows coming in. That alone is going to put a lot of stress on this engine because it's going to keep coming up with new identity columns over and over again to insert. Okay, maybe that's not so bad, but we also have a massive insert coming from streaming. So imagine these are concurrently going on. Each one of these is going to have to keep getting an identity column, while the other one is also competing to get identity columns. And you have to make sure that neither one of them ever gets the same value twice. So if we had our example with like a little table to the side, and I thought about doing this once just to, to get an identity column equivalent, well, you'd have to lock the table, grab the latest value, hold it until you could increment it. And you might do it very quickly, like grab the value and write a higher value right away. But again, you're going to have to do that on each insert. Grab it, grab it, grab it, and write out a value each time. And you've got this competing job, which is also trying to grab that 
value and get a value that it can use to insert. So they're competing, and this can lead to a lot of locking, right? You can get table locks. In the SQL days, they call that a deadlock, and you can get deadlocks even in a scaled up platform like Databricks. So the questions become like, okay, so how does Spark get the next identity value? And how will it avoid impacting Spark performance? We talked about it could potentially lock. It's gonna have to wait while each value is being retrieved. So if you've got a, a trillion rows, we'll say, that could be a fair amount of overhead. And also, it can definitely not do anything where it searches across nodes to get that value because that would be a massive hit on your performance. And we talked about the potential for table locks, and this is a really big one and a concern I have, and you should too. And we'll talk about that a little more because it turns out you shouldn't use it when there's a high risk of that. Now, when you talk about locks, I should mention that in your traditional world of relational databases, when you're creating data warehouses, the load is typically done in a batch window. What's a batch window, Brian? So a batch window is typically like overnight. Sometime in the middle of the night, the job would kick off. It would load any new data and then it would finish. Sometimes during the day, maybe a couple of times during the day, you might refresh a data warehouse. But in the old days, the more traditional days, it was really done during a time when people were generally not using the data warehouse. So there was really not a lot of competition for the data. And generally in a traditional data warehouse, each table would probably have only one source coming into it at a time. This is before we had those streaming sources, which complicated everything. So again, it was a simpler world. And so the identity columns worked really well. So what about delta logs? Well, that's something to consider too, because in the relational world, the, the logs are kind of just ubiquitous. You don't think about them, but SQL Server, Oracle, whatever, it just maintains them. But when you deal with delta tables, these are actually flat files. They're JSON files that are a fair amount of overhead for the Delta engine to maintain. I'll show you a little bit about what it's doing with identity columns in the log, but bear in mind, that's some overhead you have to consider all the time when you're doing Delta tables. I'll put a link in the description in which I go through a very detailed breakdown of how Delta logs are created and maintained. And it's really worth knowing that because that is the engine to Delta tables. So this is the documentation I found online, and we already saw this kind of syntax above, generated always, but apparently it's an option by default. So I guess you could override it and just say by default and not use it, but always is what we would typically use. And we're saying as an identity, and you can also give it a start point. So instead of just letting it start at one, you could give it some other number like 10 or 100. And then you can also say, by how much you want to increment. So step, you could say step by 10, and it will just keep going 10, 20, 30, or whatever you want to set that to. Now there's some things in here I want to call your attention to, and this is the documentation that says, this is how you create an identity column. But as I mentioned, it tells you in the documentation that you must use a big int data type. It also tells you something which I didn't realize until I read the documentation, but they're not guaranteed to be contiguous. What's contiguous? Contiguous means that You'll, you'll have no gaps, right? One, two, three, four, five. Instead, you might get something like one, two, eight, nine, ten, and there'll be a gap in there. So that's interesting and good to know. The other thing to consider, which is interesting and good they tell you this, but the following operations are not supported. Partitioning by an identity column. That would be a really bad idea anyway, so I think this is to protect you from yourself. If you partition by an identity column, which is unique, then every single row will always be in its own partition, which would lead to horrible performance. So bad idea. The other thing is you cannot update an identity column, which is a really good idea also. You do not want to be updating identity columns. The whole point of them is that they're immutable. You assign them, that's your primary key, and you stop mucking with moving primary keys around. It ain't gonna be pretty. So those are good restrictions. This other part is interesting too. Declaring an identity column on a Delta table disables concurrent transactions. Only use identity columns in use cases where concurrent rights to the target table are not required. And that is interesting. I first jumped in and said, this is great. I'm going to use it. And I used it on a common table. I had a, a job logging table that every table update was coming into. And I was trying to <laughs> insert into it. And I hit this problem. It actually didn't stop me per se, but it kept breaking. It kept hitting an error and then doing a lock on the table and it says fail transaction. Their workaround I came up with is to kind of do a loop, try again, try again. But in the end, because I was using it for a common table, the overhead was just too much and it wasn't worth it. 
Now, the restriction that it will not support concurrent updates is a pretty big one. In fact, if you put all these things together, they're pretty big limitations, but that's the biggest because there are a lot of reasons why in a given table you may have concurrent updates. And worse, a table which today does not take concurrent updates might require it in the future. So if you made this your primary key, we'll say on a sales table, and you're like, that's okay. We just do a load every so often and insert rows. And then suddenly you maybe you merge with another company or they change the way they want to do this. And they say, we'd like to be doing batch, but we also want to do streaming or maybe streaming by store. And which each store is now going to be writing to the table, you can get yourself into some trouble. So that's a pretty big restriction. And in that sense, most use cases probably aren't best suited to using identity columns. So what should I use instead, Brian? Well, in my case, when I needed it, I created a GUID. And so maybe in another video, I'll show you how to do that too. If people want to see that, put it in the comments. But you can just do a, a assignment in Python, which is UUID, and you get a GUID back, which is just this long string, and it, it's guaranteed almost like 99.9% .9 to never be duplicated. So it works pretty well. But it's a lot of overhead, right? You get this long string where you had nice, efficient integer. So it's kind of a bummer. But again, it's got to do with this overhead that you get in a scaled up platform. So a spoiler alert. I hit this the hard way, to be honest. And I did research and I had to finally track down, like, how exactly is this identity column value being maintained? Well, I had a lot of problems with my own usage of when I first tried it. So I tracked down what exactly it does. And most importantly, where is it storing the values it's using? Well, if you look here in the delta table log, remember I said how important those are, that's where it's maintaining all the metadata really, the column descriptions and everything. And it has to do it there because it's through use of the log table that it can allow things like schema evolution. So if you add columns or remove columns, it will reflect that in your log. So you can see here, delta identity start, and then the rest of it, delta identity step, the delta identity high watermark. Now that, as far as I can tell, is the last value used. So it would grab that, increment it, and then write it back with the next value. Or it, maybe it does it in a batch if it locks it long enough and you're doing a lot. But it's going to, each time you do updates, it's going to update that with the last highest value. And then you see allow explicit insert. That's set to false. That's because that's the default value, but you could override that if you wanted to explicitly force inserts into a table. Very few cases where you'd want to do that. It's not recommended because now you're kind of defeating the whole purpose of an identity column, but there are edge cases where you might need to do that. So you can see this is being maintained in the log file. So not only do you have to be concerned about locking on the underlying parquet files of your Delta table, but you could also have locking on the log file itself when it's trying to figure out like what's the next identity value or something. It may have to hold on to this a little longer to get some information. So again, there's some limitations to this. So wrapping up, we talked about what is an identity column and we learned that it's really just an auto incrementing number that we can attach to a column. And then the Delta engine will take care of maintaining it. It'll just add one, two, three, four, five, or we could set it up to start beyond one, we could say start it wherever we like, start at 10. And we could also say, instead of just incrementing by one, we can set that also. We have some other options, but that's the basic idea. And the most important reason for using an identity column is just to get a unique primary key for a table. We talked about the use cases, which is getting a unique primary key for a table, most often used to create a surrogate key when you're creating dimension table rows. And we reviewed how you can create an identity column. It's very simple. Uh, we saw the code. It's just the way you define the column that you want to be the identity and it will automatically generate it for you. And then we talked all about the challenges to using identity columns on scaled up platforms. And that really becomes the showstopper. I jumped in very excited when I saw identity columns and then I, <laughs> I learned the hard way. They're not very easy to use and unfortunately, generally not a good idea. I hate to say that because it sounds like a really cool feature. I wish it worked better, but I think it really is just a limitation of using a scaled out platform. It just isn't suited to that. And finally, we talked all about the limitations in detail. And that's it. So I want to thank you. Please like, share, subscribe, leave comments. And until next time, I'm pulling for you.
all in this together. Thank you.